we really got off to a good start here in the book of Philippians. And uh, you'll uh, in your place there. The book of Philippians has four chapters, 104 verses, and 2,183 inspired words. The key words in the book of Philippians are all and rejoice over and over and over. You see him rejoicing. And you know what's, you know what's wonderful about that? He wrote, he talks about rejoicing more than any other book he wrote in Philippians. And you know what the great part of that is? He was in jail when he wrote it. In prison. And I'm, that's, the Apostle Paul gives us an example. And if you put the average Christian in jail today, they wouldn't write home about how much rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say in the joy of the Lord. Goodness, I didn't know this was going to happen. I'm about to die. Get me a lawyer. You know, that's the difference between our generation and his. And it was written to the saints, uh, to the bishops and the elders and the deacons. And A.D. 61, 62, that's about 30 years, 28 years after Jesus went back to heaven. The book of Philippians, Paul's in jail. The Holy Ghost gives him these words. He writes these 2,183 words to the church in Philippi. And we got down to about, I think, verse number 10 or 11 last week. And... Um, uh, we hit eternal security there. And one of the best verses on eternal security in the whole New Testament is verse 6. He that begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, we hit uh, how a pastor, I, it's, it's, it's pastor appreciation stuff. We ought to have church appreciation stuff. And I hope you will. Um, and because I have you in my heart, he said there in verse 7. A real pastor has a church in his heart. It's not a job. It's not a a job. To, uh, you know, it's not like you're just working for a paycheck. It's not it at all. It's a calling. It's a ministry from God. And that's, uh, uh, you can tell it too. I've heard preachers at preachers meet and get up and say, boy, y'all pray for me. That bunch of devils. I got a pastor. They're all full of the devil. And everything. Uh, I, you'll never hear me talk about this church like that. Now, I might think it and say stuff to you here, but I am man enough to tell you to your face and don't go off at a meeting somewhere. And go, when I go off somewhere, I say, I have nothing but good to say about our church. And nobody else better not say nothing bad about it neither. Amen? Amen. 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 We're a family. I don't want to Listen, if you'll stand there and let somebody talk about your family, you ain't much. You need, you need some uh, uh, backbone, brother. Uh, I'm not going to let somebody talk about my family. Uh, Excuse me. If I'm, if somebody, if somebody says something about our church, you know what I always say? I say, well, our church ain't perfect. We got our faults. But I'll tell you one thing. That's where we felt. We've seen more people saved this year than uh, 90% of them. And I'm not saying that bragging. I'm just saying uh, we it ought to be in our heart. And so uh, uh, the Lord puts a lot of emphasis on this stuff. And we'll start with verse number. 10, we talked about the day of Christ, and there's a lot of uh, disagreement about that day of Christ. It's only in the Bible like two times, I think, here in 2 Thessalonians 2. And uh, some preachers try to dissect that so much to make that. Because in 2 Thessalonians 2, the answer before that day. So it can't be just on the right. The day of Christ can refer to that whole period in there, uh, tribulation period. All the way to the end of the millennium. There's one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, six days. Seventh day, the Lord rested. There's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 6,000, where we are now. Seventh day, day of the rest, day of Christ. Now, uh, there'll be some disagree with me on that, but the only way you can make it the rapture is to, or, uh, is, to, is to make the Antichrist here first. And that don't work. Now, tonight, uh, we'll start in verse number 11 and read... Uh, as, as follows uh, so chapter 1 verse 11 being filled with all with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God now filled with the fruits of righteousness um, walking with peace uh, in our daily walk we ought to be filled with the fruits All right, treat people right, act right you know, a lot of this stuff in, in Philippians is just normal, everyday Christian life. You at work, you at school, 
how to act, how to treat people. And if you're not careful, this old flesh, it'll rise up just like that. Just like that. Somebody will say something to you at work, and it rubs you wrong, ticks you off a little bit. If we're not careful, we'll fire right back and be just as bad as they are. And we as Christians have to learn how to walk with that, fruit, with that fruit of righteousness all the time. Verse 12. But I would you should understand, brethren. Look at this now. He's in jail. He's in jail. That the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. So that by my bonds are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And in many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, look at that. Isn't that amazing? You know what he's doing? In, 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 in uh, verse 12, he's sitting there in jail, and he's saying, look, y'all, here I'm in there, and probably got my hands tied, feet tied, rats crawling all over the place. I might get one little piece of bread every day. and." Uh, my guy's writing this down as I tell him what to write. And, and I'm telling you, the, these things that have happened to me, I'm in jail. Don't y'all worry. Don't y'all fret. These things have actually caused the gospel to go out more. And here we see a great truth. We see a great truth. If God has his hand on a man or a church or a movement, if God has his hand, no matter what happens, it always keep prospers and is being blessed. I mean, I mean, you, how are you going to do with a man like that? And we're going to see that over and over and over in the next few minutes. What are you going to do with somebody? You beat him, you put him in jail, and he starts singing Amazing Grace, and the jail doors fly open. If you kill him, there'll be a thousand more rise up because of his faith. And, and I mean, what are you going to do with somebody like that? Uh, the world has no answer to the real Bible-believing Christian. They can't do nothing with us. Because no matter what they do, we it turns out to, to the Lord's good and the furtherance of His kingdom. Uh, he said, uh, I mean, he's singing Beulah Land, brother, in jail and writing. And that inspired millions to keep on. How many missionaries, how many people that got uh, arrested and thrown in jail were have been inspired to hang in there because Paul was in jail. I don't even know if he knew that was going to happen. He might not have. He might not even realized how God was going to use this. I, to tell you the truth, I'm not even sure Paul knew that was going to be in the Bible. It, uh, there, there's nothing that says he did. Uh, I don't know if he knew he was writing more scripture as he wrote these words. Maybe he did, but I, he, he said a, he wrote a bunch of stuff that didn't get put in the Bible. And said a bunch of stuff that didn't get put in the Bible. My goodness, y'all. He just done what God gave him to do. He kept the victory. And you know why I believe God blessed Paul? Because he didn't whine and cry and bellyache about how God had mistreated him. And here he gave all his life to preach. And look at all I've done. And now, the, boy, nobody appreciates me. They're all out there having fun. And I'm in here locked up. Uh -uh. No. He said, I there and rejoice and do rejoice. Look at verse number um, uh, look at verse 18 we'll come back to 12 what then notwithstanding every way whether in pretense or in truth Christ is preached and I therein do rejoice yea and will rejoice he's in there shouting because been inspired by him suffering and out preaching the gospel glory to God hallelujah look back at verse 12 I wish you'd understand brethren Things happen to me that happen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Now, history is full, history is full of examples like this. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good of them that love God. It's all, it's all the way through history. You hear me talk about Corey, Corey Ten Boom in, in Nazi concentration camps, brother. I mean, what good could possibly, that eating bread. Having a guard stand outside, being strip searched and embarrassed and nearly starved to death and cussed and made fun of and thought, how could God ever? This can't be the will of God. And here tonight, I stand here talking about her in 2023 and millions of people have been blessed and encouraged.
by what she went through. So if you're going through a hard time tonight, if you're going through trouble and trying, don't, don't you miscalculate and don't, don't misjudge the Lord and don't think, well, it's, I must have done something wrong, right? Well, God, or God, you've made a mistake or you forgot me. Don't, don't think like that. You pray, Lord, I'm doing the best I can to live right and serve you. And somehow or another, you're going to get glory out of this. And it'll fall out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. You know, uh, I've had people tell me, uh, I picked up an old drunk one time. And uh, it, we was driving down the road and I was trying to witness to him. He said, Danny. I said, yes, sir. He said, you, you've been through a lot, ain't you? I said, I sure have. I said, but God's been good to me. And he said, you know what? If I ever do get saved and come to church, I'm coming to your church. And, and you know what? You know what, y'all? People watch how we handle trouble. And they watch to see how, it, if there's any difference between us and them. And subconsciously, when they see you going through stuff and you keep on, and they, especially with a smile, and they know you're hurting, and you've been to the funeral home, and you've been to the, uh, the graveyard, and you've been to the divorce court, and you've been to the cancer ward, and you, and you just keep on keeping on. The world says, you know what? I'll tell you one thing, they've got something in them. And that's what Paul said. He said, these things, these things have inspired a lot of people. You, you, when you're faithful during trouble, that's what tells what kind of person you are. You know what the test of your character is? The test of your character is what does it take to stop you? That's a test of your character. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't take a whole lot to stop them. First time a little something don't go their way, they quit. Um, I, I plan on telling a few personal experiences Sunday. The Lord, don't change my mind on, on that Sunday morning on, for, the, for the pastor thing. And I, I used, usually they have a visiting preacher you're supposed to, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little while and tell some personal experiences. So I hope all of you be in here. And um, sometimes it ain't, it ain't always uh, hallelujah and glory and pats on the back. Sometimes it's the very opposite. The very opposite. I mean, uh, and I'll tell a few stories uh, this Sunday, but sometimes people see a preacher, and the only time you ever see me is up here, what I'm doing right now, and you just sort of get, oh, I don't even can't stand him. I probably run his mouth all the time. Uh, you, you just see me when I'm up here preaching the Word of God. You don't, you don't see the battles. You don't see the scars. You don't know the heartaches. And, uh, and that's what makes us good Christians. As a matter of fact, if you look back on your life, I can look back on my life right now, and the times that I really grew was when I was suffering. It wasn't when I was having a big time somewhere and people gave me a nice love offering. and It was all them times when I suffered. That's when you grow. That's when you grow. You don't grow much on the mountaintop. You know, Paul, his ministry produced more fruit, him in that jail, than probably would have been out there running around preaching. And that's what he says here. He said, these, these things have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Look at verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are made manifest, are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. My goodness, it made it on down there to the palace, brother, to the, to the, to the big shot, the hot, like we'd say the White House, uh, uh, his suffering that he had went through. And verse 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the Word of God. They look at it and say, bless God, if Paul can do it, I can do it. They put him in jail, and I'm telling you, I've had that happen to me. I remember hearing Brother Ed McAbee, one of my mentors, talked about how that he uh, he talked about how he was in the service and how when he was young, he, he got burned. He pulled down a, his mom had a pot of boiling water on the stove and he reached as a kid, and he pulled over, and he said it burned the skin off his back. And he had third degree burns all over and had to go to the hospital and all that. And he told about some experiences like that. And he told about how he, 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 people run him off and stand up in revivals and do like that, you know. And I've had him do that. Uh, I've had him do that. I've had him stand up. I had a guy stand up in revival one night, right, right back on this side. He stood up and went like this. He went and turned around, like running out the door. And all I did was say the Beatles with a bunch of old mop headed fornicators. And they was. And he got mad and walked out. And uh, Lord, I don't know what he'd do if he really heard somebody preach hard. 
But uh, 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 I heard Ed say that, and you don't know the times that when I was going through stuff, I thought, Brother Ed made it. Brother Ed made it. So see, God used his trouble. Now, we don't like trouble. Nobody wants to go through suffering. But I got something for you here. Look over at verse 29. You know, all the blessings you get getting saved, all the the mega church preachers need to preach on this. It is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. It's part of the Christian life, y'all. That's what's known as doom and gloom, negative. uh, uh, Listen, you, just like it's given to you to believe on Jesus, it's given you to suffer. Now you might as well get used to it. You might as well just buckle down and say suffering is part of the Christian life. It might be physical, it might be mental, it might be financial, it might be uh, some, some family, but you, if you live right and serve God, you are going to suffer. It's given to you so that we can identify with Paul and we can identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know you don't like that and I don't neither. Uh, but you just might as well make up your mind. Look, <laughs> uh, that song we sing, I've known more joy than hurt. That's true. God's been good. So my blessings far have outweighed my battle. And, and But you cannot have blessings without battles. It ain't all battles and it ain't all blessings. It's both. Paul's shouting rejoicing one minute and saying that I may know him. It's part of me, the fellowship of his sufferings. You just might as well get used to it. Somebody going to break your heart. Somebody going to hurt you. You're going to have a wreck. I mean, why do you have to be so negative, brother? Because what do you want me to do? Tell you the sun's cold? Is that what you want? Or do you want the truth? I mean, good night, y'all. It, it, you cannot get through life without suffering. You might make it a while, but sooner or later, hard times are coming for all of us. Sooner or later. And... It, the best way to make them minimal is, is don't sin. Uh, and, and the Lord will help you and bless you. Because if you're sinning and backslid and then your trouble comes, you think, oh my goodness, this is because I'm sinning. But if you're living right and trouble comes, you think, it's just the Lord let me go through a test. The devil's fighting me. And it's a whole lot easier to go through. If you feel like it's your fault, that makes it ten times worse. So he said, uh, uh, he said uh, people make fun of the Bible scoffers, but we use it to convince sinners, and, and Romans 8, 28 is still in the book, and he said in verse 14, they're much more bold because of me. You know, when you see when you see a man up preaching with boldness, it'll make you bold. When I hear somebody preach, I was listening to Cody's on another night, and Frank and all them, man, it made me want to get up and do it too. Amen. I want to say, glory to God, you know, you've heard the old saying, charge hell with a water pistol, you know. Uh, that's really not true, but uh, it's a good a little old saying people have, and it, in, it makes you much more bold. When I seen people preaching on the street when I got saved, that made me want to do it. So when you do right at school, listen, you say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be the oddball at school. You'd be surprised if you'd really take a stand at what it might inspire other people to. You might be surprised. Take a stand at work against everybody dressing up like a devil last night. Take a stand at work of... Uh, of uh, of uh, whatever, whatever your situation might be at work. Uh, some, if they're having a party where they drink, take that stand and say, I don't drink alcohol. You'd be surprised. You might encourage somebody else saying, you know what? They got the guts to do it. I'll have the guts to do it next time. You're much more bold, much more bold to, uh, to speak the Word of God. When, they, when them guys heard Paul was in there suffering and they was out here, I bet you they got them a handful of tracks. And they said, you know what? Paul led us to the Lord. Paul preached to us. We're not going to hell when we die. He's in there suffering. Let's carry on the torch that, that he, he had. Amen. Amen. And uh, that's, that's what he was saying there in verse number 12 or 14. Much more bold. Much more bold. Now, notice uh, uh, quickly. I've got to mention this. Look at verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. That means they some preachers reason of contention 
not sincerely. I wish every Sunday school class would do a whole lesson on sincerity. When's the last time you heard a preacher preach on a whole message on just being sincere? Like being sincere. I have before, a long time ago. Look at it. Supposing that affliction to my bond, but the other of love, knowing that I'm for the defense of the gospel. Now stop there just a second. He said, look, he said, there's some of them out there preaching Christ not even sincerely. They're doing it for a paycheck. They're doing it for a name. They're doing it for some. They're out there preaching. But some of them are doing it sincerely. And that word sincere, teach your, set your kids down, teach them a lesson on being sincere. You know, you'd be surprised if you read the Bible how much emphasis the Bible puts on motive. You'd be surprised. Study your Bible sometime and look how many times it talks about your motive. That's the word of God discerning the intensity of your heart. See, it's not, it's not just, well, I sing in the choir every Sunday. Well, I, 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 I try to dress right. I try to, that's good. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, but you know what God does? He looks at you. Why? Not what you do. Why you do it. Not why you do it. Why you do what you do. You know what the Lord looks at? He looks at you, what you do when nobody's looking. And, you, and you're driving down the road and a temptation hits you. And nobody in the church is right. Maybe you're out of town or on vacation. And the devil, he, he looks at you right then, buddy. And he watches what you, that's, that's your, the real you. The real you. He said, some just preach Christ even of envy and strife. Uh, I don't know why a person would do that, but they, they are, Lord have mercy. I, I mean, such a generation of preachers we got now. Uh, it's, it's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Um, some preachers, their whole ministry, I, preachers now, their entire ministry is trying to show how wrong uh, other preachers are. That ain't no ministry. That's no ministry. Uh, I, I witnessed the two Mormon girls yesterday. They were missionary. I walked in a Taco Bell down in Kings Mountain, and I walked in there, and I could tell immediately. And when I seen them, I thought, "Good night. What's that?" Because they had they had dresses on down to here, and their hair was like, and they just looked clean. Their face looked clean. Nice young ladies, probably about 19, 20 years old. I don't know what that's. I don't know what that is, but. They ain't no just average old, that ain't a Halloween outfit. Uh, and sure enough, they were Mormon missionaries from Utah. And I tried to wait, and I told them, I said, you girls look clean. And they said, what do you mean? I said, like morally clean. You look, you just, their face, you know, sin shows on a person. You sin a long time, it'll show up on you. That's why the ugliest old hag in the world, them old Hollywood movie stars, have been living like the devil when they're about 80. Oh, that scare a freight train. I know. Uh, the, you know, the prettiest thing in the world is an older woman that's lived right her whole life. That's the most, it's just, they have a beam and a glow. Uh, you look at some of these older ladies, look at these old hags that didn't live right. <laughs> it's scary. Uh, uh, but it, you, there, you, uh, this, these girls, I tried to witness to them, and, and I said, I'm a preacher. She, she said first, she said, I like your shirt. That's why we get them camp meeting shirts made. Just like DJ's got on it, said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, that's, that's good, y'all Christians. And they said, we're missionaries to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I said, okay. Uh, so I began to talk to them there a little bit. And they asked me, they said, what do you preach on? I said, I preach on everything. I preach the gospel. Jesus died, rose again, buried, coming again, all that. But then there's a bunch of other stuff too. They looked at me like, what? Pride, jealousy, envy, self-righteousness, fear, judgment, hell, uh, laziness, self-righteousness. Lack of burden, apathy. Uh, and they looked at me like, we ain't never heard of that before. And I, I gave them a track, and they gave me one of their little things. They walked out, and I threw it in the trash can, and they took mine back. That's what you, any literature they'll give you like that, take it. They say, here, can I have 50 more of them? Take all they got and throw it in the trash can. You are doing a good deed when you do that. So that's trash. Amen? Yeah. All them calls and everything. Take every bit of literature that Jehovah's Witness will get you, brother. Give you, brother. And uh, don't line your bird cages with it. They might kill them birds. Put it in a trash can where it belongs. So uh, you, you, there's a lot to preach. But hurry, hurry. He said, not, not sincerely. How could somebody preach Christ not sincerely? Do you know what? I've always wrestled with this verse just the But the other of love, Knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. 18. What then? 
notwithstanding, in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So basically what he's saying there is, even if the guy ain't sincere, if he's preached Jesus Christ, somebody might hear it and believe, so praise God, let him go. I have a little bit of reservation with that. I want the guy to say, shut him up, get him out. You know. But the Apostle Paul, evidently, evidently, there were some guys preaching. I guess what they was preaching right was right, but they weren't sincere. He thought, well, glory to God for getting the word out. I guess it'd be like this. Uh, you ever had a drunk help you give out tracks, something like that? I mean, the track will still get the job done. So if, if a fake preacher quotes a verse of Scripture, you never know. Some drunk at home might hear that verse of Scripture and get under conviction and get saved. So in that sense, I'm say, I think is what the way he meant this. He surely was not saying they're a false preacher, but God bless them. He was not bidding them Godspeed. What he was saying was, if they're putting out the truth, even if they ain't right, that's their problem. Let God be glorified and Lord. I think that's about the, this. I'm, I'm sure that's the sense that, in which he meant it. Uh, we list this guy, uh, Darren, we said, we're out on visitation, and he comes on radio up and down here in Hickory, probably a, probably a fine man, I'm telling you, that guy, I'm telling you, I, I can tell you what he's going to preach on this Saturday. Yeah, I can tell you, after, you turn your radio on, I guarantee you'll preach on. He's going to preach, there's no such thing as the Antichrist. He's going to preach, there's no such thing as the rapture. He's going to preach that all of our churches have been taught wrong, and just scramble up half the verses in Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel, and just have like a big pile of spaghetti. And when he gets through, you don't even know what he's talking about. And his whole ministry is saying how wrong we are as Bible-believing Christians. And it's a Baptist church down the road here. Now, that ain't no ministry. There ain't no way the Lord's going to lay it on your heart every Sunday to preach how wrong the Baptists are. You know, I mean, you might reach out there and slap it once in a while, but the Lord don't call... The Lord don't call, like these recovering fundamentalists and some of that. Oh, what a bunch of, why don't they get a job? You know what? They, you say, well, they're safe. You know what they need to do? Start a bus route. Yeah. Some people need to start a bus route. Instead of pit, nitpicking about anybody trying to do something for God that they disagree with on something, won't they go win some souls? But no, they want to hide behind that keyboard and tie. Oh, no, you self-righteous. Oh, you think a preacher got to wear a tie. Oh, you think a preacher got to wear a tie. Oh, you think da, 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 da. Well, um, hush. Go, go, go start your church and win some souls, buddy. Now, I'm not saying the Baptists don't need rebuking once in a while. We do. But if that's your whole ministry, you ain't got no ministry. You ain't got no ministry. I ain't no ministry. What kind of ministry is that? Like, like Miss B's favorite preacher. You know what I'm talking about. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, he does say some good things. He, uh, I'm talking about Spencer. And he's a, I'm just messing with you. Kelly, Kelly told me to do that. Uh, 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 but my mom used to listen to Garner Ted Armstrong. I come in and I said, Mom, he's a heretic. She said, now, Danny, he says some good things. And he did. He did say some good things. And uh, 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 he, but, he, but he was hung up on the Sabbath. I used, this guy used to write me letters, and he was hung up on that Sabbath. And I'd get a letter, and he'd say, Danny, you are leading your flock to hell. Saturday is the real Sabbath, which I know that. And he said, the Catholic Church changed it to Sunday, and you it's the mark of the beast. We took the mark of the beast. That's going to church on Sunday. All of us have the mark of the beast. Right. And I, I think I wrote him back one time. Most of the time, I just threw it in the trash. I think I wrote him back and said, man, I don't go just on Sunday. I go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We go seven days a week. How's, what's that? Uh, uh, that's no ministry. That's no ministry. The Lord don't call somebody to just preach for 20 years on how wrong another group is. He calls you to preach the Bible. So the preacher I'm telling you about down here, he needs to preach a sermon on the little boys and the fishes and the fed to 5,000. See what I mean? That's in the Bible. That's the gospel. He needs to preach a sermon on Jesus and the woman at the well. 
Not just how wrong doctrinally somebody is. Uh, he, he, he may be sincere. Uh, but Paul said, I rejoice as long as he's getting the truth out. I therein do rejoice and will rejoice. Verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, strange verse. What he's basically saying is... Uh, uh, not, not my joy don't come from me getting out of jail. God ain't delivering me from jail. My joy comes from the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You ought to get something from that. You say, well, if God would just change things in my life, I could really be happy. No, He wants you to be happy and rejoice in them things. You ain't going to change them, and He probably won't neither. Because if He did, you'd be meaner than you are now. Uh, you, you would never pray. You'd never read the Bible. Uh, you'd be spoiled rotten. So God gives us trouble and problems and burdens and sickness and stuff. Keep us, keep us down. And, uh, and, and you, he said, the supply of Jesus Christ. According, verse 20, to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. What are you going to do with somebody like that? He said, if they kill me, I magnify the Lord. If I live, they magnify the Lord. Cut my head off, magnify the Lord. I'll have a new and for my toes quit wiggling. That's what John, I think one of them old preachers told uh, John Wesley one time, or one of them got, it was a, it was a, um, it was one, a French Huguenot. And I, I, Ruckman talking about that church history stuff. He said, a French Huguenot, they took him and uh, they said, uh, We'll put you in exile. And he said, glory. Uh, he said, my home's in glory. They said, we'll take away all your possessions. He said, that's all right. My treasure's low. They said, uh, we'll kill you. And he said, uh, I'll be freer in chains than you are out of them. That's what he told them soldiers. They said, we'll put you in chains. He said, I'll be more free in my chains than you are without them. What do you think they thought about them people? Good night. They said, well, we'll cut your head off. And he said, that's all right. My soul will be in heaven quicker than your majesty's horses will be back to the palace. I bet they thought, my goodness, I ain't messing with y'all. Uh, you know what they said, the real teachers of church history? They said every time they kill one of them Christians, ten popped up. The church thrives in times of persecution. And what's wrong with America today is we've had it so good for so long that we honestly think the Christian life is being well fed and well clothed and blessed in material things and having our family around us and not getting sick. We think that's a Christian life. Now, if you get that, praise God. But the Bible preachers didn't have it. And the great preachers of old didn't have it. Might have had it some. But man, it was jail and fight and threats on your life. Oh, John Wesley, his wife used to stand up right in the middle of his meeting, right in the middle of his preaching, and stand up and say, you're a liar. John Wesley, you was out drunk last night. His wife. Now, see, we hear about the great John Wesley. That's one of the reasons why he's great. When you can still stand, when you can still stand, when all hell and your family and the world and half the churches are against you, then you're learning what it means to be identified with him and fellowship of his suffering. So that's what basically the Apostle Paul was saying here. He said, look, I'm locked up and they're probably going to kill me. But if they do, I'll see you on the other side. I, on over there, I won't get to it. I'll get to it next week, Lord willing. He said, I have a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. What are you going to do with somebody like that? I'll just beat you. That's all right. I'll get a blessing. I'll just kill you. I, I Go ahead. I have a desire. He's suicidal. I, I, he wanted, You know, he got to see it over there in Second Corinthians. He got a little glimpse of it up there. And he said, I've seen it in that vision, man. I've been wanting to go ever since. I heard a preacher say one time, he said, if the Lord let us get a good glimpse of heaven, we'd be living dangerous. You know, taking chances and everything. Well, won't, won't hurry up and get there. But we'll talk about that next time. All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for our health and strength. Thank you for all the many, many blessings of life you've given us. 
Lord, I pray right now that you'd accept us, our sorry selves. We are here tonight. Thank you for people that love you. Thank you for people that still believe in you in this ridiculous, wicked, woke, liberalistic generation that we live in. Oh, God, thank you so much for the Holy Ghost and the Word of God that keeps us straight. And I pray, God, that if it ever comes our turn to, uh, to face that final test, dear God, please have mercy on us and give us strength to pass it. Lord, bless us all. Help us, our faith, be put in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Whatever you do, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody, you're dismissed. Uh, Saturday morning, 9.30, we're going visiting. And then uh, the, the get-together is 6 o'clock. Do I need to say anything about it? Drinks. Bring two-liter drinks, please, if you don't mind.